a very pleasant morning to one and all thank you all for joining us to this virtual national webinar on sexual and reproductive health myself mrs infan henzia p lecturer department of obg rv college of nursing feels honored and privileged having an opportunity to be the mc for today's event it gives me an immense pleasure to extend a warm welcome to you all on behalf of rvcm before start the session i request all to keep your camera off and microphones muted to avoid unwanted disturbances thanks to reproductive health care and education is a fundamental human rights essential for equality health and dignity of all people especially young people to begin now i invite mrs uma mageshwari hod department of child health nursing to welcome the guest and beautiful gathering over to you ma'am smiles are the great investment the more you collect the better you feel a very good morning to one and all this day is an opportunity to raise awareness about sexual and reproductive health issues and to educate to reduce and spread awareness about sexually transmitted infections i congratulate the program organizer mrs sheila hod department of obstetrical and gynecological nursing for her hard work in arranging thank such a session thank you ma'am at the forset i would like to welcome our today's ma'am dr sanjay sharma ceo and managing director at the association for transgender health in india sir is here with us today to address psychosexual development and sexual and reproductive health issues thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation and gracing this occasion on behalf of rv college of nursing i wholeheartedly welcome you sir next it's my honor to welcome our next eminent speaker of the day dr pramod consultant sex therapist and clinical psychologist at pramod institute of sexual and marital health private limited kerala sir is here with us today in this online platform to share the information on sexual health sexual dysfunction and infertility welcome you sir the uh, leader is the one who lights the path to the impossible and takes those who follows to great heights it's my great pleasure to welcome our respected principal dr s r gajendra singh for his constant support and encouragement in organizing this webinar on today's burning issue sexuality and sexual health welcome sir next it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome dr i clement hod research and development and professor mamta nistel hod department of medical surgical nursing for your moral support and motivation in all the events welcome you sir and welcome you ma'am I, uh, i i wholeheartedly welcome dr uh, dr ramu the dean of nursing uh, nursing in rghs i welcome you sir wholeheartedly we we would like to extend a special welcome to all the delegates and nursing faculty students from various institutions thank you so much for honoring our invitation and gracing this occasion your presence makes us very happy hope the session will be the fruitful one to each and every one of you present today have a good day thank you ma'am we cannot change the outcome but we can affect the journey now i invite dr s r gajendra singh organizing chairperson and principal rv college of nursing bangalore to deliver the inaugural address to the gathering over to you sir good morning everybody today's esteemed efficient and erudite resource persons for this webinar on sexual and reproductive health awareness day dr sanjay sharma ji retired year cmd and ceo as well as managing director of uh, ati organization new delhi and dr k pramodo renowned clinical psychologist from dr pramodo institute of sexual and marital health private limited cochin kerala my dear nursing faculty and our dean nursing dean dr k ramu from rajiv gandhi university health sciences and nursing fraternity from different colleges 
my dear nursing students delegates i wholeheartedly welcome you all for this webinar stepping into our today's topic on sexual and reproductive health our vedas proclaim that sex is the basis of the cycle of life and also the sex is the foundation of creation and preservation so without sex the existence of life is not possible in this planet the union of the male and female counterparts of supreme being is the ground to the universe of the manifestation in human life the main aim of sex is connected with existence of life and its sole purpose is for procreation recreation and continuation of one's race and ethics today here i would like to say the literally the reproductive health is the state of physical mental emotional and social well being as well as proper function of reproductive organs in all phases of a reproductive age so to conclude being in good sexual health means you are well informed careful and respectful to yourself and others and also enjoying yourself sexually in a way you are comfortable with socially ethically and legally in an approved manner today our main objective of this webinar is to enhance the awareness of sexual and reproductive health which you need to focus on educating every youth about the sexual and reproductive health and creating awareness on safe sex pregnancy healthy baby also preventing sexually transmitted diseases like hiv and aids and also we are here we are emphasizing the complications of unintended teen pregnancy and early pregnancy infertility birth control methods and postnatal care of mother to say here in india discussing about sexual wellness and reproductive health issues which are not openly discussed and these are considered as taboos and uh, a kind of uh, indifferent stigma due to which many health issues are going unnoticed for years together in our indian society so today's webinar is aimed to make this subject as much more comfortable to discuss on providing sex education and its importance in health promotion components and its significant concern of sex and reproductive health issues because currently millions of indian population is suffering with sexually transmitted diseases that is like hiv and aids reproductive tract infections and many are victimized with early unintended pregnancies and other physical and mental health issues so the lack of sex education and awareness as well as improper guidance on safe sexual sexuality and reproductive life sex related behavioral risk factors are making our young generation to be more vulnerable for sexual exploitation and many havocs in their personal and social life so today major issues and concern is making awareness focusing on sexual health sexually transmitted diseases pregnancy contraceptives infertility abortion pre pre puberty puberty menstrual hygiene menopausal and psychosexual and gender related social issues among males and females and also can highlight on genital dysmorphia and related mental stress among youths are important to discuss on this platform today here many a times patients are very much hesitant to talk about sexual health with their doctors concern due to embarrassment or lack of knowledge on sex and uh, reproductive health topics 
even healthcare professionals do not introduce the topic to their patients and this results in their patients feeling unrecognized and unreserved unreserved unserved once again i would like to say that today in this forum we have efficient and erudite resource persons from prestigious institute of india to explain more consistently on physical emotional changes associated with puberty behavior towards opposite gender gender standards and moral codes sexual problems as well as how to identify them and their solutions and their therapies which are required to treat them regular medical checkups for both men and women as well as regular usage of condoms vaccinations post sex clean up and getting tested regularly for sexually transmitted diseases so here safeguarding public health is not only the responsibility of the government each and every indian civilian shall join hands in raising awareness and safe sexual and reproductive health awareness so that we can create healthy young generation in our nation on this occasion i am very much indebted and thankful to our honored and esteemed resource persons for today's webinar dr sanjay sharma ji and dr pramod pramod ji i thank for both of you wholeheartedly on behalf of rv college of nursing for accepting our invitation for sharing your knowledge on this platform specially relevant to burning issues related to sexual and reproductive health and also i extend my heartfelt thanks for all bearers of organizing committee for this webinar so dear participants and delegates i hope you will be having good takeaways of this webinar and kindly participate actively and take advantage of our today's scientific session thank you jai hind thank you sir for your valuable words <coughs> to start the session we have two eminent speakers among us today for sharing their valuable knowledge and experience gaining knowledge is the first step to wisdom sharing it is the first step step to humanity now i request mrs sheela j hod department of obstetrics and gynecology to introduce the eminent personality today's speaker to our esteemed audience over to you ma'am it is my privilege to introduce our first speaker air komodo dr sanjay sharma sir is an alumnus of armed forces medical college pune and college of defense management secunderabad he is trained in pediatrics from army hospital rr delhi he has to his credit a masters of management studies from osmania university he has commanded two air force hospitals and was the first consultant administration administration of the armed forces medical services he is currently the ceo and managing director of association for transgender health in india a non profit organization incorporated on 1st november 2018 he is the board member of world professional association of transgender health since jan 2021 he is currently working with ministry of health and family welfare through naco for setting up a center for excellence for transgender health at aims new delhi completed a global education initiative certificate certified training course in best practices in transgender medical and mental health care and is now a certified member of world professionals association for transgender health he runs a gender friendly holistic healthcare clinic kem clinic at gurugram haryana india he is an active member of swikar the rainbow parents a parent support group for the lgbt qai community it is indeed a proud privilege to have you amongst us sir so over to you sir thank you for the kind words uh, mrs sheila it's really a privilege to be uh you know once again uh, among students from uh, what i gather uh, that the majority are nursing students and uh, 
it's always such a pleasure to talk to young people. For one, it uh, cuts down your age and uh, you know gets you back to uh, an atmosphere of learning. And uh, I want to share with you that today is a very special day. Not only because it's uh, the national day of uh, awareness for uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health, but today the Ministry of Social Justice is uh, launching the uh, very important uh, program called SMILE, wherein it is going to uh, launch the program for providing transgender health care to uh, this uh, marginalized uh, uh, subsection of society. Yes, they are very much part of society and we uh, on our part need to understand uh, a little more about them. Today we will be speaking uh, about uh, the cis hetero majority and uh, but while we do that, I would also try to bring to the fore the issues that are faced by uh, people who are diverse, people whose uh, gender uh, is uh, uh, incongruent or who have uh, a difference in sexual orientation. Uh, among this umbrella of LGBTQAI is also the intersex uh, group, uh, people who have differences in sexual development. And these are uh, uh, a small group which are very less talked about. So we'll come to all that. Uh, first, I have this uh, technological challenge of trying to share my screen, which I will attempt now. So let me get the screen on. Okay. So I hope you can see my screen. Ms. Sheila, you'll have to help me there. Yes, sir. It's presenting. Okay. So let me get my presentation on. Okay. So the topic that was given is psychosocial developmental perspective for sexual and reproductive health. So before we begin, you know, like, uh, we must understand as to why there is need to talk about sexual and reproductive health. Dr. Gajendran uh, brought it out very beautifully that for a species to propagate, one needs to address these two very important aspects of health. Yes, they are aspects of health uh, which go on to uh, give us that holistic health. And when we talk about holistic health, we talk not only about absence of disease or infirmity, but we mean uh, well-being, physical, social, and spiritual well-being. But before we reach well-being, let us let me take you through this uh, journey of how a, a human being progresses from uh, infancy to adulthood. And the area that I'm going to be talking about is the psychosocial development. The psychosocial sexual development. The word sexual is a part of the social development that takes place. Hence, it is hidden. And it is hidden because this is a taboo subject. This is a subject not very many people are comfortable speaking in families, speaking in societies. What is uh, scary is that even healthcare providers tend to hide this uh, aspect, this very important aspect of health. Uh, in, in the text, when we are addressing patients or when we are going out to do healthcare, this aspect is sadly ignored. But then that is a topic for discussion for all of you. This is a topic that we must ponder on. And as students, investigate as to how we can make it better for the people that we are setting ourselves out to care for. So let's, let me start this journey of this uh, human form. This human form, who is 
uh, experiencing life through the uh, through their eyes and through the inputs that they are receiving from family from society from other adults that surround them and this issue of who am i this question comes very early in uh, a child's life as early as 2 2 years of age when the child knows that uh, you know what feelings they have inside however what they are wondering is that among all these adults and other human forms that are surrounding them who do i identify with do i identify with that more male looking person who is uh, looking at my security and safety or do i identify more with that uh, very maternal uh, human form that soft figure who gives me comfort and nourishment how much of those traits of this female i have or i would like to identify with how much of those male traits do i identify with and i'm helped along by the cueing that is done by the adults and the adults know about me by the information that is given to them when i was born and uh, when the doctor or the nurse or the attendants they looked at my external genitalia and told my caregivers that look the sex assigned at birth is male or female or if they were confused they would say it's ambiguous but however rear this human form and based on this information the adults around me started giving cues as to what they think uh should be the roles that i will uh, perform and these cues were given in the form of the clothes that i was made to wear the toys that were shown to me well even the uh, the arrangement of the nursery that i was uh, in and these cues would uh you know prompt me to make a choice the choice in front of me is very binary i need to now choose whether i fit into the binary of male or i fit into the binary of female by and large uh, more than about 94% of uh, the population are able to make a little adjustment and become comfortable in one of the binaries that is put in front of them and here in starts what is known as gender labeling wherein i as a boy am uh, playing with guns as toys indulging in tumble play and i am labeled as a male as i progress through my interactions with the family and later my interactions with school and my peer group this more or less fits into what i think is being is the label that i have been given and i would uh, say okay this is what i want to be throughout uh, the rest of my life and uh, this would uh, qualify to be called as gender consistency however not all of us have this consistency very early on that know about 80% of us attain gender consistency by the time we are hitting uh, school that is about 5 5 years of age there are large number of us who uh, do comfortable with the uh, sort of silo that they have been put into are still questioning and these uh, set of people or subset of normal people would be uh, would be said to have gender fluidity this period of fluidity may last uh, you know maybe early school or it may extend right through adolescence and past adulthood we may have adults who have still not 
uh, affirmed as to what gender they possess. They are still questioned. They are still gender fluid. They are non-binary. Yes, I'm throwing a lot of terms at you, but these are the uh, words or labels that we hear apart from the label of male and female, which is, uh, or the cis hetero label, which is uh, the majority. Yes, all of these exist. As I go through this process of understanding who I am, I get comfortable in the identity that I assume. And this is my gender identity. By and large, for the large majority, that is the cis majority, this identity that I affirm matches the sex that is assigned to me at birth. So I am, so to say, congruent with society around me. Once this identity business is over and I am simultaneously growing and interacting with others, mind you, I am also maturing in age. My nervous system is also growing. My physical structure is also growing. And I start now interacting with others who are also growing along with me. When I want to express what I feel inside, I take up a manner of dressing or I take up a manner of behavior. And this whole combination of how I move, my body language, my clothes, this defines my gender expression. And as I pass through puberty, and puberty is a difficult time for all of us, because herein, and uh, this puberty starts very, again, quite early, about nine to 10 years of age, we have started uh, seeing differences in body shapes. The, uh, the female form is becoming more curvaceous and the uh, male form is becoming more muscular, sprouting hair here and there. The females are changing faster than the males. There are strange emotions which are coming up. And now I have attractions. These attractions are very different from the ones which I have for my family members. And these are attractions which are built into any living species. These are the very attractions which uh, are essential for procreation, for finding a partner who, with whom I uh, can have physical satisfaction with whom I can be comfortable enough to uh, uh, get into the act of producing another uh, form like my own, of uh, being able to care for another uh, uh, human form. Yes, to have reproductive health. And this sexual orientation starts again quite early at nine years of age that means about fifth class these uh, changes have already started the sexual orientation also goes undergoes a period of fluidity wherein i uh, take my experiences share it with my peer group and depending upon their uh, acceptance or non-acceptance exhibit the orientation that I possess. And if my uh, orientation matches the, uh, uh, the majority and it is for uh, the opposite uh, form, then I have a heterosexual orientation. However, this may uh, also be there for a form that is similar to my own. And then it would be called as a homosexual orientation. The word homosexual is not uh, a very kind word. And hence, we rarely use it. Uh, we don't uh, uh, you know, call anybody 
homosexual. A better word to say would be gay. Or we say a person with different uh, sexual orientation. But then just as there are there is a variety or there is a variation in how we express our gender, so is there uh, the variation in our sexual orientation. One may be attracted to the opposite or to the same, to one or many or to none. And hence, you hear of terms like uh, uh, bisexual, pansexual, asexual. Uh, you also hear uh, words uh, like, uh, uh, you know, scoliosexual. Scoliosexual is a term which is used for people who are gender diverse, having attractions for other people who are gender diverse. So, so much for normal uh, process of uh, gender and sexual orientation. Mind you, as the child is growing, the way the child perceives and the way the people cue depends upon what language they use. And language is so important. So important uh, when we are communicating with each other and also so important that we know the right words. Because if we are going to use words which are derogatory, and I just gave you an example of one such, then the person to whom we are using that word is going to become uncomfortable. And we as healthcare providers may not be able to do uh, justice uh, or give them comfort. Because the first step with any person who comes to uh, seek care from us is to make them comfortable. So that you need to know the language. So hence, all these terms that I've used today are something which I'm sure uh, you as students will like to inquire and investigate and, uh, you know, get into your vocabulary so that you address the person in the most gender friendly manner. You, uh, uh, as the person is uh, going uh, to the, uh, the psychosexual, uh, the psychosocial part, or as they are changing their appearances and interacting, uh, what we know as pubertal changes, which are classified as Tanner stages one to five, uh, where you have uh, changes in the, uh, the way the uh, hair growth is uh, this, and also in the way the genitalia look, in the way the most development happens. So while all these processes happen, language becomes very important. And as a healthcare provider, as a nursing student, as a nursing instructor, or as a doctor, as a physician, it becomes very important that I know the language, I know what is the right word, I know how to make the individual comfortable. I also do not bring my baggage to the conversation. That means I'm not just going to let tomorrow there is a individual option who is not conforming or is not so to say congruent with the way the heteromajority majority is. Then I should not get my uh, uh, prejudice to uh, now, shun that uh, person away from healthcare. I need to know the right words. I need to speak the language that would make people comfortable. Okay, so uh, I'll uh, start from here. And uh, please correct me if, uh, if you have missed out. What I had uh, covered till now uh, was as to how the cis hetero majority uh, develop, uh, undergo development, uh, their psychosexual development. Uh, I was uh, talking about uh, the issues which happen if there is a mismatch. Mismatch in either the way I perceive my gender to be or the way I perceive my sexual orientation to be 
with what is considered as uh, uh, okay by the majority or by the people around me who are giving me cues. If there is a mismatch, then in gender, then I uh, fall into a category of gender incongruence. And if there is a mismatch in sexual orientation, then I fall into a category of differences in sexual orientation. And these differences in sexual orientation may be uh, bisexual, pansexual, asexual, scoliosexual, wherever the word sexual comes and there is a uh, uh, prefix to it, then we are talking about orientation. And wherever the word gender comes uh, as a suffix, then we are talking about gender variation. So I may be uh, by gender, I may be uh, uh, transgender, I may be uh, gender non-binary, or I may be gender non-conforming. So all these terms are related to mismatches. Are these abnormal? Absolutely not. Because let me remind you that these are all subsets of the normal. Just as you have uh, any data, and if you were to put it uh, in one place, we have a normal uh, distribu distribution of data, then the majority would be cis hetero. That means the gender matches the sex that is assigned and the sexual orientation is towards the opposite type. However, I may be normal, but I may not confirm. So there would be incongruence. And this is the mismatch. The biggest issue that mismatch does is the fear of non-acceptance. Now, all of us have been to school. All of us have been uh, you know, among the peer groups. And all of us want acceptance. If we are afraid that we will not be accepted, if we are afraid that uh, the narrative that we are bringing is, will not be accepted by the person uh, with whom we want to relate, with whom we want to interact, then we will go into a shell, we will go into a cocoon, we will go into what is known as a closet. This like Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. okay. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll continue. I thought uh, again the mic had gone mute. Anyways, so this fear of accept, uh, non-acceptance would Excuse push me, me sir? Yeah. Sir, you have 15 minutes more. Try okay, wait, wait. Uh, so this closet may uh, happen very early in uh, life, as early as childhood or in the family, or maybe when I'm in school and my sexual orientation is being uh, uh, is coming to the fore, or maybe later as an adult. Now in this closet, this is a very uh, uh, scary place to be because here it, your uh, incongruence gets uh, enhanced, your internal conflict gets enhanced. And if this is coupled with non-acceptance and non-resolution of your issues because the other people don't know, then you will get into an external conflict. And this whole thing will lead to an uncomfortable feeling, which is called as dysphoria. Dysphoria is what leads to high-risk behavior because I am my narrative is not being accepted, hence the trust that I need to have with the adults and the peer group around me that breaks. I get more prone to self-harm, substance abuse, land up in mental health issues. I also have lifestyle disorders, poor sexual health. Uh, reproductive health becomes non-existent and I end up with decreased life expectancy. These are issues which get magnified 
in people who are diverse. Hence, the action point for intervention for all of us would be to prevent this dysphoria. Uh, we need to prevent internal conflict by understanding the psychosexual development and uh, reassuring the individual that their experiences are also true, their experiences are also acceptable. We as uh, students and healthcare providers need to address the mental health issues, need to understand uh, how high-risk behavior can lead uh, to so much of harm. We so need to address the external conflict. We need to know about the sexual health issues which will happen. Because sexual health uh, means that I uh, would have pleasure with the person that I interact with. However, in a diverse person whose narrative is not held, this activity becomes uh, 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 abnormal. I may indulge in sexual practices which uh, uh, can uh, lead to uh, sexually transmitted uh, illnesses because I am not uh, uh, educated enough about uh, uh, use of contraceptives or about uh, how to protect myself. I may be uh, exposed to violence. Uh, we also need to understand that if we are to ensure good sexual and reproductive health, then we uh, need to start these uh, discussions in families. We need the parents to understand the normal psychosexual development, also understand the variance. That means the parent, irrespective of whether the child is uh, uh, is in falls in the majority or uh, is uh, in the minority, I should, as a parent, know. I, as a school teacher, must know. I need to understand gender and sexual orientation, and I need to address this fear of non-acceptance. That means as a healthcare provider, I need to be uh, vigilant to pick up those red flag signs where I find that a child is not interacting or an individual is not comfortable opening up uh, in front of family and friends. And uh, I need to step in. I need to uh, prevent uh, uh, marginalization happening. I need to ensure that this person's rights are uh, given. I need to have the right language and understand the gender identity process and help the child uh, attain identity. The, and that will only happen if I respect the narrative that the individual is getting. I also need to understand that sexual orientation is not necessarily hetero. It is not uh, necessarily, uh, uh, you know, something which uh, is abnormal to have feelings for other, uh, 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 of other kinds. And there is nothing illegal about it. There is nothing unethical about it. Are these uh, intervention points I need to do? Because if I don't do that, I can never prevent closeting. I can never prevent exclusion. And this is the main uh, step that we as students, as uh, responsible members of, the, uh, of society, as professionals need to do. I'm sure Dr. Pr uh, Pramodu would be covering more of these uh, issues in his talk. We need to accept the narrative. We need to rebuild trust. It is only then that people will really be free and have that dimension of wellness. All uh, wellness, as in spiritual wellness, emotional wellness, physical wellness, being able to uh, be happy in the workplace, being happy, be able to be happy with society. Yes, I use this platform to give a call for ownership. Because sexual and reproductive health cannot be done without 
the LGBTQAI plus community participation. It needs interaction with the Ministry of Health and Welfare. And I am so glad that today, like I said right in the beginning, the Ministry of Social Justice is launching the uh, SMILE scheme. We already have a center of uh, talks with aims for the center of excellence in transgender health. We are already talking about gender affirmative care clinics. And I hope a large number of students who are uh, learning uh, nursing, who are teaching nursing, would look at this very uh, interesting field of transgender health. We need the teachers to know. The Ministry of Education has brought out uh, uh, the new uh, education policy. And herein, the primary school teachers need to be uh, trained so that they are able to give a gender friendly environment for children to grow, for people to attain uh, their full potential, to uh, not get into mental health issues, to retain trust. And we require the Ministry of Social Justice to pass good laws, to enforce good laws. And uh, uh, I would also share with you that today, India is, has got the best laws and the most powerful act in the entire world. We are the first country to have uh, transgender uh, healthcare uh, coming in in an organized manner where we have involved the Ministry of Health, we have involved the Ministry of Education, we have involved the Ministry of Social Justice. And today uh, we talk about transgender health in each and every uh, domain. Yes, when we talk about sustainable developmental goals, which uh, have been, uh, uh, which we are supposed to attain by 2030, we need to keep transgender health in the center. We need to understand this subject, this umbrella subject, which covers all issues that LGBTQAI plus uh, community face, not only reproductive and sexual health, but holistic health. Thank you so much for your time. I have uh, finished my presentation. Uh, let me attempt to get out of the sh sharing screen and I am there to answer questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, session is open for queries from the delegates. If you have any doubts, you can put it in chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask. Delegates, if you have any queries, you can ask now. Uh, so I So I have a question. Okay. So uh, can you just highlight on the rights, sir? Or is it legally um, accepted in our country? Can you highlight on the LGBT community's legal rights? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so we have a Transgender Protection or Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act, which has been passed by our uh, Indian Parliament. And this act came into force in uh, 2019. And uh, this act uh, lays down the rights of the transgender person uh, persons. And herein, the transgender word is used as umbrella term to cover all people with gender incongruence, people with differences in uh, 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 sexual development, and also people who belong to uh, communities like uh, the Kinnar, the Hijra, the Joktas. Uh, these communities are traditional communities and they have uh, a majority of uh, people who are gender diverse. Uh, all of us as uh, healthcare providers must understand that ethically it is, uh, it is important that we give care to whosoever is coming to uh, seek it at 
the healthcare institutions. We uh, keep pace with the medical evidence. The medical evidence has is very clear that gender incongruence is not a disease. They have also made it very clear that sexual orientation is also not a mental health issue. Uh, that means it is perfectly all right for any human form to have to uh, assert the gender that they have or the uh, uh, orientation that they have. In our country, if there is sexual act which is happening between consenting adults, then there is no illegality. I will repeat, if it is an act which is happening between two consenting adults, then there is nothing illegal. There was a law which uh, criminalized homosexuality and that law has been struck. Today, if you uh, uh, discriminate against anybody, any person due to his orientation or uh, gender uh, affirmation, then you are liable to be prosecuted by law. You are the one who is going to be in the wrong. If you as healthcare providers do not know, then again, you would be giving less care. Your uh, uh, practice would be questionable. So as far as India is concerned, nobody can be prosecuted because of difference in sexual orientation or uh, uh, gender uh, affirmation. This is the law of the land. It has come into force in 2020. That is the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights uh, rules have been put out. There is a program which has been uh, launched by the government of India uh, today, uh, which is giving them the rights, the rights for uh, getting gender affirming uh, interventions in all healthcare facilities. So we need to learn up, we need to educate ourselves and understand that there is nothing illegal about uh, sexual orientation. Yes, you want to get married to somebody that is governed by different set of laws. But if it's and uh, if you are uh, as one human being with another consenting human being, then there is nothing illegal. I hope I have made myself very clear. Thank you, sir. Sir, delegate, uh, question from delegate, sir, from Mamarja Koswi. Um, I want to ask you that we as individual nursing institutes, how can we contribute towards welfare of transgenders around us? Thank you for that. So the first thing that you need to know is to learn the language. You need to first, as nursing uh, uh, institutes and uh, students and faculty need to make that person comfortable. So don't go by looks understand and ask, right? So we ask the person their name, their preferred pronouns, and we document in what is known as a two-step process. That means I uh, take down what that individual is giving me. And even if this does not match with the documents that have been presented to me, let's say my photograph is different on the Aadhaar card, the name that is given is different in the Aadhaar card. Then I do a two-step uh, documentation. I record the name that is being given to me, the gender that is being affirmed that is given to me, and I get it in my hospital records accordingly. Any documentation that happens will follow this thing. Second thing we need to understand as nursing people that it is no longer the binary of only male or female. That means in a gynecological suit, you may have a trans man coming in because uh, they would be still uh, requiring certain uh, uh, 
preventive uh, uh, health care uh, facilities uh, that uh, need to be given to them. They may be requiring uh, uh, reproductive uh, uh, assistance to be given to them. They may be requiring uh, surgical assistance that needs to be given to them. We need to understand that they also require preventive health care. Similarly, a trans woman may walk in and though she looks like a woman, she has certain uh, uh, tissues which require the preventive health care people to uh, assess. So as nursing institutions, we need to do two things. We need to learn the language. We need to get the documentation right. And we need to educate ourselves. We need to uh, unlearn that these are uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, sick or uh, who have some mental illness. We need to unlearn that. We need to look at them as individuals who are approaching you and give them care, not necessarily every person who walks into your uh, facility is looking for cure. A large number just need care. And by your uh, teaching and by your learning, you can uh, take this very important step of giving care, right? So as nursing uh, institutes, this is one thing that uh, is very important, which we must understand and implement. Uh, have a gender-friendly environment. Have gender-neutral wards. Have gender-neutral care. Start learning. I think that is very important. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Shani Matthew, uh, we should first, I too agree with that, what you have said that we should be taught about the gender first. And there is one more question, sir. Dirupa Atikari, good afternoon, sir. I have query about adaptation and marriage of LGBTQ, TAQA. Okay. Regarding so, adaptation and marriage. Yeah. So, uh, you know, these are, uh, I'll just take you back to uh, pre colonial times, right? Uh, the time before the British were here, and uh, to time when uh, uh, in the Indian subcontinent diversity was celebrated. And caring for another human being was not a taboo. In fact, if you go towards the Northeast, uh, caring for children uh, by any family does not require that child to be uh, a biological child. Uh, so when, when the British came, they were coming from a very rigid binary uh, kind of a teaching and uh, they implemented this on us and they erased our cultural uh, heritage. So today we are in a situation where uh, we have adoption laws which do not permit uh, uh, people with the same uh, uh, sex to adopt another uh, child. This will change and this change has to come through webinars like this, through questioning that young people will do and they will ask that if a human being, the forms, the diverse forms of human beings are all normal, then why can't a progressive society make space for having diverse families? So this will, this is uh, something which I think uh, will get addressed with the uniform uh, civil codes that are being discussed, where we will remove this uh, uh, baggage of, uh, uh, you know, pseudo binary uh, eth ethics that people uh, uh, try to impose on, uh, on young people or this pseudo uh, morality that is uh, imposed on another uh, person. My one question back to the young person who has asked this is that if 
two people are happy with each other? Should not a progressive society ensure that they remain so, so that they can, uh, you know, contribute to the society instead of making two happy people unhappy and spreading unhappiness? That's a question that all of us should be thinking. And yes, we require a uniform uh, civil code which gives equal rights to all human beings. What is very interesting is that in our constitution, nowhere is uh, uh, gender mentioned. Nowhere is it male and female. It is citizen. So each citizen should have equal rights and human rights also say so. So uh, this is something that I very uh, passionately feel about and I implore you young people to please take it up, advocate for it. We do require uh, people who can look after other people. We uh, require better adoption laws. We require uh, uh, marriages which are, uh, you know, which allow a family unit to form, uh, to be allowed for uh, uh, between two human beings who are consenting and to uh, have a progressive society. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, sir. There are uh, other many queries also, and many of them have expressed their concern to support the organization as well. So I have uh, shared with them that they can uh, very well Google Ati on uh, the website. They can go through the website where sir's contact details and the work done by the organization is available. So if you want to support, you are welcome. And uh, there is another question, sir, like many legal protections have not been provided, including same sex marriage. What next steps are the LGBT organizations taking to make it happen? And being an LGBT supporter or a citizen of this country, how can we support such organizations? Okay, so uh, the first thing that any LGBTQAI uh, organization or a person who's an ally should understand that the, uh, uh, the lawmakers, they give you stepping stones, right? It is for us to identify those stepping stones and start building on it. The Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act is one such uh, forward move. Yes, there are uh, issues because uh, there are certain uh, uh, areas where, uh, uh, you know, violence against uh, people who are uh, different has, uh, has not been addressed completely. But then this is a, a stepping point and we need to lift off from here. I would also implore all LGBTQAI plus organizations to start uh, using the portal that the government has uh, put up and start registering because so far the number of people who are affected is not known to the government. When we uh, do informal uh, uh, work, we know that the LGBTQAI uh, segment of society is more than 16%. But when we did the census, we were not even able to count 5 lakhs. So if, if we do not know the numbers, then we cannot provide. So this is one area which we need to work. There's another very important area that we need to work. Most of the work that has been done in the scientific field has been skewed. It is not taking, uh, because the data has not been given. So I think all LGBTQAI uh, communities should strengthen data, should start, uh, and the right place to start it would be uh, with the healthcare facilities. So as we teach two-step documentation, we will start getting data as to the LGBTQAI people. And once we have data, then we can give gender affirming interventions, we can uh, educate and, uh, you know, we can make the world more uh, progressive and uh, friendly. Yeah, so that is what I think the LGBTQAI community should do. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. We have many questions pouring out, but uh, since we have shortage of time and the next speaker is waiting, so I think sir will be happy to answer all your queries if you can mail him. So, sir, can I give your mail, share your mail ID please, to them? Please do share my mail ID. You can share my mobile number, right? Yes, and uh, I'm available on WhatsApp. Uh, please uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, you can go on to my website. I have put out a, a video on uh, the act also. So um, uh, please uh, educate yourself and educate others. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I will be sharing the uh, sharing sir's details shortly. So thank you, sir, for such a wonderful uh, talk. Thank you so much. So I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Promodu. He is a consultant sex therapist and a clinical psychologist at Dr. Promodo's Institute of Sexual and Marital Health, Kochi, Kerala, which is his brainchild. Dr. Promodo has been trained in sex therapy from American Association of Sex Educators, counselor and, and therapist, and also by Council of Sex Education and Parenthood International India. He possesses more than 28 years of experience in the field of sexology, especially in treating sexual dysfunction, including all sorts of sexual problems. He has published various research articles in national and international yeah. journals, and he has presented his research work in various international conferences. He is a member of various associations and has held posts both in private as well as government setup. For the contributions in the field of clinical psychology and sexual health, he has been awarded the R. Take Kishore Young Scientist Award in 2002 by the Indian Association of Clinical Psychologists. He has backed the paper award for the research work on male sexual dysfunction at the National Conference of Sexology, Mumbai in 2002. He has presented Rati Sukhasare, the first scientific sexual health program in ancient net television for more than a year. Dr. Promodo is also active in electronic and print media in sexual health literacy. He is a trainer, resource person in sexual health workshops and seminars. We are very pleased to have such an eminent personality amongst us. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for the nice words. A very good afternoon to all of you. And out the outset, I would like to express my Sincere thanks to the organizers, especially Mrs. Sheila and the principal, uh, Mr. Gajendra Singh, for giving the giving me this opportunity. And you have already listened to a wonderful uh, lecture by Commodore Sanjay Sharma. I don't know how my presentation will be. In, uh, the topic you have given me is sexual health, sexual dysfunction, and infertility. Since we are going to talk about the sexual matters, I expect that none of the children along with the uh, parents or people, elders are listening to this session. Because there may be one or two slides which shows explicit uh, sexual organs or something. So I do not want the children to listen to this uh, uh, program. And this, I am presenting only scientific things, nothing pornography or anything. So I would like to take the permission for that. And you can be very comfortable because we are going to have only theory, no practicals. So what is sex? What is sex? It often confuses all of us. As per the definition, sex is the sum of biological characteristics, characteristics that define the spectrum of humans as male and females. So in any species, you take both males and females are there, even in the trees. So these are the biological characteristics which differentiate a man from a woman or a woman from a man. So this is what sex, but usually, People use the same sex for even sexual act and many, many other aspects. We're even talking to about sexuality, they interchangeably use the term sex. Now we have to understand certain terms before going to the 
aspect of sexual health. What is sexuality? It is a part of a, an individual's personality. It encompasses the biological difference, that is sex, gender, sexual and gender identity, sexual orientation, erotism, emotion, attachment, love and reproduction. So all these things are linked, so you need to understand these themes in a little. What is sexuality? It is experienced and expressed. How? In your thoughts, fantasies, desires, beliefs, attitudes, practices and relationship. Again, it is a, an interplay, interplay of multiple factors. See, the biological, psychological, socio-cultural, everything, all this, when a boy or a girl is brought up, during the developmental period, his or her interaction with the society, peer group, family members, and whatever knowledge he or she is acquiring, the cognitive set, all these things are going to define his or her sexuality. Now, what is gender? Already you have heard, listened to what is gender, gender identity, etc. But it is a sum of cultural values, attitudes, roles, practice and characteristics based on the sex. How do you define a male in a society, a female in a society? How do you define a transgender? All those things come under that. Gender identity. I believe that I am a male. And he or she believes that she is a female. That is the gender identity. And now we got transgenders also. Biologically, a person is born in a male body, but he thinks that it is, he is not a he, I am a girl. But unfortunately, my soul is trapped in a male body, but I am a female. That is what gender identity. Now, it is an internal framework constructed over time. What is sexual orientation? That is the erotism, your attachment, your feeling, your emotional attachment with reference to sex and gender. Then what is sexual health? It is a very, very broad term. Sexual health means in a simple term, an individual's ability to enjoy sex and ex sexual act, enjoy the sexual act, the ability to express uh, sexual desires in which the way which in which he wants but at the same time he should not be affected by any STDs there should not be any dangers in it there should not be any unwanted pregnancy uh, there should not be uh, any other problem and at the same time it should not create any harm to his or her partner this is the definition of such. sexual health is the integration of the somatic, emotional, intellectual and social aspects of sexual well-being. That's what I, felt I said, well-being, the feeling, all those things in ways that are positively enriching his personality, communication and love. This is the typical definition suggested by uh, various organizations. Now, sexual health is experience of ongoing process of physical, psychological, and socio-cultural well-being related to sexuality. I don't uh, waste time on explaining all these things. These are theoretical. It is evidence or expressed in all your behaviors and uh, expressions, etc. So now this is a concept we have introduced. What is sexual medicine? I'll give you an idea about sexual medicine. Sexual medicine is a medical and psychological speciality that deals with the sexual health. Then another aspect is it involves assessment, that I mean clinical assessment, diagnosis and treatment of any particular sexual problem. There are a few major components of the sexual medicine. Here you can see it deals with the male part. Both male and female are having sexual problems. So there comes the andrology, 
and gynecology. Then, on the other aspect, it deals with the psyche affecting sexuality because the mental problems, psychological distress, mental distress, everything can affect the sexual health. So, the role of clinical psychology and psychiatry is coming in. Now, different there are different dimensions for sexual medicine. See, one is the promotional dimension. There, what you are going to do? You are going to increase the awareness of the sexual health among the public. And it again helps to have a healthy and fulfilling sexual life. And also to prevent sexual, uh, prevent the sexuality education and counseling is always a best, always the best tool to prevent many various problems. Like there are so many people comes after the marriage, and they don't know how to have a sexual intercourse, where to penetrate. See, I had a, a patient once. He was an MSc in uh, botany, and working as an officer in government service. Married for three years, but never had children. They came for that particular problem. And whenever a gynecologist examined the female partner and asked you and said, you never had any sexual intercourse. Why? No, no, doctor, we are having sexual intercourse. My husband used to rub the penis against my vagina. And the gynecologist had to describe her how to have an intercourse so there are people because of these misconceptions lack of knowledge so many problems are uh, occurring and nowadays if you take watch any electronic media especially the television social media or open in a newspaper there will be hundreds of news about the uh, sexual abuse sexual crimes rape many things why it is there in the society because I would say it is a lack of sexuality education. We don't give proper sexuality education to our children. Only if you give proper appropriate, age appropriate sexuality education, then only our children will grow as sexually healthy people. Then curative, the assessment, diagnosis and treatment of any sexual problems. Then rehabilitative, the rehabilitative role is that when the, a person has been suffering sexual problem for several years, is not taking treatment. So such people can be treated and uh, we can cure them or help them. Now, again, I'll show you what is the sexual medicine in a graphical way. Sexual medicine is not a single specialist job. The andrology is coming in, gynecology is coming in because the male and females are there. You can see sex therapy for many problems. Sex therapy is required. Marital therapy is there because marital discord often leads to sexual problems, even leads to fertility problems. I had a, a several a few couples uh, who have been married for several years, never had a sexual contact or infrequent sexual contact. As a result, they never had children. So uh, this is an important area. Then clinical psychologist role is there. Neurologist should be there, urology, andrology, it goes in hand in hand. Then radiology should be there. Many evaluations may be there. Surgeon, then anesthesia, then general medicine, diabetology, cardiology. All these things are, these fields are related with the uh, sexual medicine. Because to treat a patient properly, you need all these evaluations, all these. Each and every patient may not require all these evaluations, but majority of the patients need an evaluation by different specialists. Depends on their physical and mental condition. Suppose a person is coming with an erectile dysfunction. Being a psychologist, I can give sex therapy, sex counseling, etc. But that may not be alone to cure his problem. There may be a biological problem, underlying biological reason. He, he may have a venous leak or arterial insufficiency or the uh, some other problem with the penis. It has to be examined by a urologist or andrologist. Then the radiological evaluation, ultrasound scan, etc. is required. So 
Suppose the person is, have, is having a high level of diabetes mellitus with the HPA1C 10 or 15, he cannot have an erection even with sildenafil separate, he cannot get an erection. So he needs to be evaluated by a uh, diabetologist and first we have to control his diabetes, then only the medicine is going to be effective. Then suppose uh, due to some other problems, so all these specialists are required. See, I have founded the, this institute in 2006, January, with a vision to offer multidisciplinary treatment under one roof for the sexual pro problem. So we have exclusively started this institute for sexual medicine treatment. And now we have catered for more than 35,000 patients from, uh, especially from Kerala and other parts of India also. And probably this is, this is the first of its kind in the whole world. I have traveled in many countries in the world. Each in each places you find a single specialist, either a urologist or a physician or a gynecologist sitting and practicing sexual medicine alone. That single man, single doctor practice will not help. It may help. You can prescribe a Viagra or some other medicine, do certain things, but it, I would say it is incomplete. So this is the comprehensive approach to sexual medicine. I am presenting this only for your awareness. Now, our topic main, uh, the importance of the day is we are discussing sexual health, sexual and reproductive health. So what are the sexual dysfunctions or which are the sexual dysfunctions which cause a problem for fertility in male? You see erectile dysfunction, organic dysfunction, either an ejaculation, retard ejaculation, retro, retrograde ejaculation, or even the delayed ejaculation. It can lead to uh, a problem where the couple is not able to conceive a child, but if it's not able to conceive, premature ejaculation, sexual aversion disorder, then loss of sexual desire, etc. Then in females, common problems hindering a sexual relationship is vaginismus, dyspareunia, sexual aversion disorder, then loss of sexual desire, etc. See, we have taken a brief summary of our cases and out of these 35,000 plus patients, purely sexual problems we had in 58%, about 17.5% we had an unconsummated marriage, infertility 14%, marital discord 11%. So these are our data. This is the data from 2006 to 2015. That time we had 15,357 cases out of that 12%, roughly 13% accounts for female problems and remaining 86, 87% accounts for male problems. And unconsummated marriages among this group was 1,407. Now, again, if we take the male part alone, out of this, 79% had erectile dysfunction. Then premature ejaculation in 12%, uh, sexual desire disorder in 3.9%, homosexuals were 2.79. They have got married, but due to the homosexual orientation, they never like to have a sexual intercourse with the female partner and somehow they trapped into a marriage, heterosexual marriage. I would say that is very bad. Before the marriage itself, he or she should express, I don't have an interest to live with a, or to have sex with a, an opposite sex. Because they did not, either they did not reveal their uh, orientation or the parents have forced them for a marriage. Ultimately, they go going to end up in a divorce and a lot of uh, family and social problems. So we can avoid many such things. Then sexual aversion disorder, then disorders of sexual preference, like frotterism, exhibitionism, that so-called paraphilias or uh, sexual perversions in a way. Then in females, 95% accounted for vaginismus. I'll be explaining what is vaginismus, then sexual aversion disorder, 
desire disorder, again sexual orientation problem, etc. So I will explain all this with the help of uh, certain cases so that you will easily understand. Here is a case of a couple, they have been working abroad, husband was 36 years old and wife 32 years old, married for 8 years and they came, the couple presented with an inability to engage in a sexual contact. Yeah, they have consulted a uh, gynecologist abroad and IUI was uh, done. IUI was done twice and it became a traumatic experience for the patient. Then the patient was referred to a psychiatrist and psychiatric treatment she had to stop because of the sedation and they have undergone they had already undergone multiple treatments elsewhere and even including uh, vaginal dilatation for a wife husband was treated with the sildenafil citrate but however despite all these treatments the marriage remained unconsummated and we have done our evaluation and we have found multiple problems like husband was having couple were having an unconsummated marriage husband had a, an erectile dysfunction pimosis he had a bilateral grade 3 varicocele oligoasthenospermia so the fertility aspect is also coming in and wife had the genismus pcod so our treatment, we have treated this couple in two parts. Number one, he had a phimosis. So without correcting the phimosis, he cannot engage in a proper sexual contact. Because whenever he tried to penetrate the penis into the vagina, the tight foreskin will forcefully attract back. As a result, it will cause a pain and he will lose the erection. For that, even if you give 1000 milligram of Viagra, it doesn't work. The actual problem has to be identified and treated. Then he had an oligoasthenospermia and a grade 3 bilateral varicose. Hence, uh, he was requiring a bilateral microsurgical varicose lectomy. It was done. Otherwise, even if he correct the sexual problem, they cannot have a child. Then wife had PCOD, which had to be treated with medicines. Then coming to the second part of the treatment, and it was a case of unconsummated marriage. And husband is ED was psychogenic, secondary to the phimosis. Then wife had vaginismus. Vaginismus need a proper treatment. What is vaginismus? Vaginismus is the occlusion of outer one third portion of the vagina causing an occlusion and as a result you cannot penetrate any object into the vagina including a finger or any object even the gynecologist will not be able to uh, examine the patient by a uh, PV so even you cannot insert a finger because the patient will keep their body very stiff and tight and push the husband away or even if the is right to examine she will not cooperate. There were patients came from elsewhere where what happened, the patient was caught hold of by two nurses. Two nurses will be called. One will be asked to catch hold of the tie of the hands. Another person will spread the legs and the gynecologist will examine by force. This is the worst thing. And as after this, the patient's condition will get Wilson and Wilson and such patients will never agree to go to any doctor after this traumatic incident. We had several such patients. This is a lack of knowledge in the area of sexual health. And so we treated it with three weeks inpatient sex therapy. As a result, marriage consummated. They had successful sexual intercourse, wife conceived, and then they came with the child. So this is the photo when they visited us with their 
child. I have blurred the photos so that nobody can identify the individuals. Now, coming to the second case, I am going to give you a few cases because this will give you an awareness of the sexual medicine and sexual health. Here, a man, a school teacher, he got married in April 2000. And it was a case of uh, almost 20 years of erectile dysfunction. When, we came, when he came here in 2020. And it remained as an unconsummated marriage due to the erectile dysfunction for two years following the marriage. Then what happened? Elsewhere he was diagnosed as a psychogenic ED and counseling was given. There was no effect. Then he was treated with Viagra, 50 mg, later on increased to 100 mg, and when he took the 100 mg Viagra, he, had, he got an erection and he had sexual intercourse once. In that single and only one contact, his wife conceived. When he took Viagra, he had severe side effects. Severe headache, myalgia, so many things. So he never took it. And he was remaining without having sexual intercourse for several years. Later on, somebody suggested to meet us. That is how he came here. And if you look at this picture, I have given, this is a color duplex ultrasound scan of the uh, patient. So this picture, here the peak systolic velocity is very low in the ultrasound scan. This scan we are doing it to evaluate the blood flow into the penis. This will be this will help us to understand the arteriogenic erectile dysfunction, venogenic erectile dysfunction, and sometimes psychogenic erectile dysfunction. This is the protocol of a or the graph of a normal individual. This is the a graph of the index patient where the blood flow was very very poor only the normal flow is above 31 30 centimeter per second here it was only 21 and here this page this normal individual it was 48 so this is a test which we do and again on the other side of the cavernosa it was only 12.5 whereas in the normal individual it was 48 it should be about 30. And this typically shows the graph. It shows an arterial insufficiency. It means sufficient blood is not being circulated into the corpus cavernosa. It is not adequate enough to achieve a hard erection, which is necessary for a penetrating. That was his basic problem. So he, he cannot take any medicine. So what is the choice of treatment? Here, we have treated him with a penile prosthesis implant surgery. These are the uh, different types of implant. This is a pump type implant and this is a different type. So we have treated with the implant. After the implant operation, penis will be like this. It will be just like in the erected state and he can have sex whenever he wants. It will not hamper the ejaculatory problem. In Kerala, we have done the largest number of penile prosthesis implant surgeries so far. Yeah, these are the different types. With the this is a two-piece implant with the two cylinders which we insert into the penis corpus cavernosa, and the pump will be placed in the scrotum. Whenever the patient wants to get a direction, he can slowly pump it, holding the scrotal skin and pump it. It will be uh, placed behind the testicles so he will get an erection after the erection after the need he can bend it so that it will go down there is another one uh, with the pump here when you pump it it will work Yeah, this is an animation of how the pump works. 
when you press the scrotum the penis will be getting erected and after you are made the sexual contact is over you can press the there is a button switch if you press the button switch it will go down okay coming to the uh, another case this uh, doctor couple came from north india husband was 39 years and wife was uh, 35 years married in 2007 it was a case of 11 years long unconsummated marriage when they came to uh, this institute for the evaluation a continuous animation is of the causing problem so here we have been talking about the uh, unconsummated marriage of a couple uh, they are doctors and the the problem which for which they came was difficulty to have sexual intercourse wife had severe fear and they have undergone iui once under general anesthesia because she had a severe fear even she was not allowing for a for a vaginal examination so ivf was done four times under general anesthesia but it was not at all successful and our evaluation which we found that she had severe vaginismus not only mild or moderate but severe vaginismus even she won't allow to touch the genital area and husband had an oligospermia and varicocele then infertility this, these were the problems identified so we have treated the male problem with a bilateral msd and the vaginismus as such if you take 17% of all unconsummated marriages have this problem and what are the common etiology which is leading to the vaginismus because we often come across uh, a lot of vaginismus cases usually the anxious girls with irrational cognition which are leading to the problem example there will be profuse bleeding or severe pain and usually in the test book it is described that many of them had past traumatic experiences okay past traumatic experiences sometimes it can lead to a genesis but usually in 99% of the cases it is not like that what we have seen from our experience is that for most of them maybe above 95% of them during their teenage early teenage or late teenage while studying in the college or so some of their relatives or friends get married they come and describe the stories that she had severe pain during the married girl recently married girl had severe pain and bleeding during the sexual contact and they would even say if i would have known it earlier i would not have married in my life that sort of stories and you listen to you listen to all sort of stories but it doesn't affect you suppose if you are an anxious girl it will go behind your mind it will be there after marriage it will creep in that is what happening that is how the pathology of vaginismus is now our treatment this lady she had to undergo an examination under general anesthesia plus the gynecologist has done the hymenectomy also then for husband we have done the bilateral msd send them off and said to come after two or three months during the second phase of treatment couple was admitted on 4th december 2018 the genesis was treated with sex therapy they had a successful coitus on 14 12 2018 that means it Yes, ten days of treatment, they could solve their problems which they had been suffering for all the eleven years, and they were discharged the soon. So here in this treatment, what is important? The multidisciplinary approach, as I said earlier, one has to evaluate and find the signs and symptoms. What are the presenting problems? You have to evaluate it, do the proper examination. by the appropriate specialist 
non-dig matter, I am examining you all. No. The gynecological part is examined by the gynecologist. Andrologist will do his examination. Even the physician do his examination. So it's all a team approach. Finally, we arrive at a diagnosis. Then we make a prepare a management plan, including sex therapy, wherever it is indicated. That is how we proceed in our treatment. Uh, with one or two cases, I'm going to wind up. Don't worry. Uh, another case is this year, husband 32 years, by 29 years, IT professional. And they came with the inability to have a sexual intercourse. The marriage was unconsummated for two and a half years. Wife consulted a gynecologist and uh, husband consulted a GP elsewhere, urologist, psychiatrist, etc. Took treatment. There was no improvement. Our evaluation revealed that it was an unconsummated and he had a psychogenic ED and female had a sexual arousal disorder. She was not getting the uh, sexual arousal, no lubrication, no feelings, nothing. It was a condition. Ultimately, what was the cause? The basic cause of the problem was severe marital discord. As I said earlier, from morning to evening, they will have fight, they will accuse each other, abuse each other. <coughs> Even physical fight will be there. And at the end, at night, wife will say, Hello, we have to have a child. All people are asking about the why you are not having children. Come, let us have a try for the sexual conduct. Husband will not get an erection. Sometimes husband initiates a sexual act and wife is not in the mood. She won't get any sexual arousal and she cannot have a sexual contact. Now, in another case, it is totally different from what you have seen. A case presented with two years of marriage with infertility, loss of erection, treated elsewhere with medicines and there was no effect. We have done our evaluation. We found that his serum prolactin level was above 200 nanogram per ml. Whereas the normal value lies between 2.1 to 17.7. Again, we have repeated the test in another lab with a higher machine. And there we found that prolactin value was 660. We did an MRI with pituitary protocol. And this is the importance of evaluations, tests. Many people, they are not willing to undergo tests. When we suggest the test, people will come and say that they are going to make money. That is the reason for the test. No, not at all. These are required, scientifically required. Why? The, the MRI protocol, MRI shows a tumor. Pituitary tumor. This is a tumor. You can see there was a pituitary microadenoma. This is a picture of the brain. And this you see the uh, tumor. So this tumor was causing the erectile dysfunction. Due to the erectile dysfunction, he was unable to engage in a sexual contact. So the final diagnosis was pituitary microadenoma and uh, he was referred to the neurosurgeon for further management. Now, if you look at the society, lot of changes are taking place in the society. If you look at, we don't have statistics about our data in from our country or it is not available. 50% of the American marriages are said to be affected by sexual coma. Almost everywhere in the world it is like that. And 55% had partner dissatisfaction or marital adjustment problems due to sexual dysfunction. This is true in our data also. And out of these problems, 60 to 70% accounts for psychological factors. Now, what are the changes taking place in the society in the era of information explosion when the internet came in there was an information explosion explosion you get all the details by sitting in bangalore you can know everything whatever is happening in the whole world 
I am standing in Kochi and talking to you. You are sitting in different places like Bangalore, Hyderabad, Delhi, at different places and listening to me. I can see you. So how? This is because of the explosion or the knowledge revolution. So it has contributed a lot for the social changes. As a result, the people's awareness about the sex and sexuality, which has increased, and they are equally aware of their own sexual problems. Yeah. And with this knowledge, many people have become ambitious, even over ambitious, and their expectations are more. And there is the relationship once, if you look back to the society, especially Indian society, many years ago, maybe 50 years ago, we promoted a yeah, single man and wife relationship, monogamous relationships. Whereas now the polygamous relationships are more in the society. A man is having multiple relationships, a woman is having multiple relationships. So the relationships problem has increased. The conflict between husband and wife. Once upon a time, wife was living as only as a housewife. She did not have any freedom to go out. You had to listen and obey to the husband. Probably in some families, it was, uh, the ladies were slaves. Now it has changed. Ladies got education, they are working, and as a result, they got money. When the money, power, and knowledge comes, you have the right or opportunity to express your needs, emotions, etc. You can be independent. That is what happens in the society. When there is a lot of competitions in the society. You have to teach the children. When the child is studying in first standard or second standard, the mother will take leave from her office and sit there. Why? My child is having examination. My child has to do some assignments. So all these things, if you look at competition, Suppose you are conducting a business, thousands of other similar business has come, new products are coming into the market. So all this level, lot of stress, stress, competition, etc. are increasing the society. Then increasing life expectancy. Once upon a time, we used to die early. Now due to the revolution, the healthcare field, Due to the good services of doctors and the nurses, our life expectancy has increased a lot. Now, as a result, a liberated attitude towards sexual relationship is there. It has come in Bangalore many years ago. Now in Cochin and Kerala also it is there. The free attitude towards the sexual relationship. Even I see people coming at the age of 18 years, 19 years with the girlfriend. And coming there and telling her, sir, I tried sexual intercourse with her. Uh, are you married? No. I'm studying in uh, plus two and I got my girlfriend with me. Can I call her inside? I said, no. You tell me the problem. I tried sexual contact three times, but I did not get the erection. Once I got the erection, I lost it. Give me some medicine. This is the change in the society. There is unprecedented expectations of the sexual function across lifespan. Once upon a time, people used to say, at the age of 50 years, if he is not having an erection, wife will say, now you are an old man, you got children, now you go and pray, pray to the Bhagavan, oh Rama, 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 Rama. Or you go to the church and do some religious things. No, now even at the age of 90, 90 years, people want to enjoy the sex. So the aging population, they are facing a lot of challenges in fulfilling their expectations, how we can counter this. And there is an optimism about the attainment of sexual satisfaction. And there is also a need for insatiable public hunger for information on sexuality. You want to know everything about the sexuality, even the UKG standard child is having a mobile with her because the COVID affected the whole world, including us. And as a result, you have your class started on the online. So you have to have your mobile and click. 
attend the class you enter into the class through your mobile phone but after the class what the child is uh, doing the child can get everything under the hood so one has to be careful about that also so then again a shift of focus from sexual function to pressure and satisfaction what is the function of sex or sexual act i would say number one it is a reproductive need to have our children that is the first biological need of sexual act reproductive need what is the second need to derive pleasure out of uh, sexual contact you enjoy the sex and the third need is relational need so recreational or uh, reproductive recreational and relational need of sexual function sex so once upon a time it was limited to the reproductive need now the focus has shifted from reproductive need you finish with one child or many couples decide i don't we don't have any children we do not want to have children we want to enjoy our life in our own way and you shift your focus to sexual pleasure and satisfaction this is what happening in the society i think finish it in 10 minutes what is asenes what is your role in sexual health you you have a lot to do to promote healthy sexuality and sexual life help the people to create sexual healthy sexual attitude promote responsible sexual behavior one should be responsible about one's own sexual behavior how i should behave sexually with other women or men how i should look at them how i should not look at them how i should talk to them how i should not talk to them all these are responsible behavior whatever behavior you do you should be able to take up the responsibility so promote responsible expressions of sexual capabilities then when there is any disease or disorder dysfunction if you come across such problems you can always counsel the patient you can advise to go and get it treated appropriate sexuality education counseling and therapy has a significant role Uh, in western countries many of the nurses are engaged in sexuality counseling they, they do there is a nurse therapist also nurses can also uh, come into the therapy session i got a female nurse therapist with me so she has been trained and we are doing it together not alone and so nurses has role got role in all these areas promotional preventive curative and rehabilitative and on the spread in the details so let us help the individuals and society to have a healthy responsible and fulfilling relationship or fulfilling sexual life and i would like to conclude here once again i express my sincere gratitude the organizing team and the leadership of the principal and mrs sheila for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, this is just a grand so for hospital okay. thank you thank you very much good afternoon uh, dr pramod uh, hello yes, uh, yes this is Yes, this is Dr. Sharon here, and I am a counseling psychologist uh, and an assistant professor in Indian Institute of Psychology and Research. Uh, uh, in 2018, I had presented a paper on unconsummated marriage, and I must really uh, appreciate you for the quality of work of research that you have done in uh, sexual health and reproductive health, because I remember that your paper was the only paper that was a backup for preparing the research uh, work. and uh, the kind of causes that you had mentioned in all your papers um, kind of really helped our team uh, to provide marital therapy and we had a lot of cases reported in bangalore for unconsummated marriage and the most of the cases out, out of like if there were two couples reporting it, one uh, one out of two was vaginismus and uh, psychogenic causes so uh, we did use uh, charts to explain uh, you know how uh, the the causes were even child child sexual abuse uh, childhood traumas 
and uh, also um, you know fear towards the male figure from the authority figure especially fathers there's some childhood trauma related to fathers so we were able to identify that we were able to bring in a marital therapist a gynecologist and uh, a physician also um, in in terms of uh, you know helping out with the examination if it is any other organic cause uh, so we were able to use a little bit of multidisciplinary approach in helping out the couple and uh, unconsummated cases up to 8 years 11 years where uh, couples were helped and uh, in a year of 2 they were able to consummate and uh, they had their first baby so thanks to your papers uh, and to the research work uh, that has really inspired uh, our team to really go forward in helping out unconsummated marriage and uh, recently there have been a lot of cases reported uh, of unconsummated marriage on a rise in the city of bangalore and uh, the causes are purely psychogenic uh, and we were able to help them because of the resource that you were able to provide through your research papers so thank you so much thank you thank you for the appreciation uh, thank you sir thank you ma'am so the link is shared in the chat box please fill to get the e certificate and all the delegates are requested to uh, open the video for photo i request um, thanks refers to gratitude gratitude is an attitude on an expression of thankfulness now i request mrs sheila j hod department of obstetrics and gynecology to set the food to propose vote of thanks over to you ma'am thank you all for that uh, patience listening gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues but the parent of all others a very good afternoon to one and all dignitaries distinguished guests heads of various institutions invitees faculties and uh, dear students i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable day first of all i thank god almighty for making this webinar a resounding accomplishment it is my utmost honor to thank air komodo dr sanjay sharma sir ceo and uh, managing director association for transgender health in india new delhi for delivering such a thoughtful session in today's webinar we highly appreciate your efforts in uplifting the transgender community and i'm sure many of us will like to extend our support in this care act sir i wholeheartedly thank you sir for accepting our invitation and imparting your knowledge with us thank you sir i it, it gives me immense pleasure to extend my sincere gratitude to dr promodu clinical psychologist and sex therapist dr promodu's institute of sexual and marital health kerala for sharing your vast knowledge out of your experience sir you shared a lot of uh, examples and uh, it was indeed uh, i open up for us it was indeed a delight to hear from you sir and though the time provided you is definitely too short to cover all such wide area and it is up to the user to find a place to hospital us i would like to acknowledge my gratitude to our principal of rv college of nursing and the organizing chair of the today's webinar dr gajendra singh for his valuable guidance and support for making this webinar the reality thank you sir A special thanks to Mr. Ashok Piaro, Dr. Pramodos Institute of Sexual and Marital Health, Kerala, and Mr. Vishal from Ati for the licensing. Thank you so much. I'm grateful for all the dignitaries and distinguished guests, invitees, faculty, and students who have joined us for this webinar. I hope this webinar was a fruitful one, and you all might have benefited from this. Finally, I would like to thank all the faculty and students of Harvey College of Nursing for all their efforts. Thank you all, and a happy weekend.